Today, I want to talk to you about an organ, an unfamiliar organ. Most of us don't know it's there, but at least half of us have it, and the other half have come into contact with it one way or the other. It's a small, squishy, donut-shaped organ. In my language tree, we call it awodienano, directly translated as the mouth of the cervix, or the mouth of the uterus. In English, it's called the cervix. My interest in women's health started when I was 17 in senior high school. One day while in school, I received a phone call from my mom telling me that one of my aunts had just passed away in childbirth. I was shocked. She had just been married about a year ago and was having her first child. One of my friends also told me that one of her family members had just passed away in childbirth. We asked each other why it was that in the foreign movies we saw, childbirth seemed to be a party with balloons and teddy bears, whereas in reality in Ghana, it seemed like a matter of life and death. This was when I decided to go into women's health to, up, to approach these issues. In 2010, I received a life-changing scholarship to the University of Rochester in upstate New York, where I was introduced to the brutal winters of upstate, but also to the beautiful marriage of medicine and engineering by medical engineering. I came to realize how much technology was used in the United States for healthcare, but I also quickly came to realize that groundbreaking, life-saving technology was exorbitantly expensive to obtain and to maintain. These technologies were not made for places that had spotty internet connection or irregular electric supply. They were not made for places where to get to the masses, you had to go out into the community. In fact, these technologies did not consider people living in less privileged parts of the world and I decided I wanted to go into graduate school to learn to develop such technologies for these areas, particularly for people who were dying from completely preventable issues. During my search for graduate school, I came across Professor Ramanujam of Duke Biomedical Engineering. She was working to develop technologies to bridge disparities in cervical cancer. Here was women's health, technology and global health, my match in heaven. To be completely honest, back then I didn't know that much about cervical cancer. But as I was doing research, I came to realize that like maternal mortality, there were huge disparities in cervical cancer between high-income and low- and middle-income countries. Even though it's completely preventable, just like maternal mortality, nobody should have to die from cervical cancer. So, in 2014, I joined Duke, and we explored the question, we know how to beat cervical cancer. In fact, tools have been developed that have saved the lives of millions of women living in high-income countries. But what gets in the way for women in low- and middle-income countries? We, address, we saw the barriers to care, like structural issues such as costs, distance to a health facility, lack of effective technologies. But we also came across a bigger issue, one that is not really talked about, that is that a lot of women are unaware, feel afraid or embarrassed to seek the care they need until it is too late, particularly in patriarchal societies where women have secondary status. A woman might feel vulnerable having her private parts examined by a provider who is often male. And also, the exam itself can be painful, that can deter women from coming in for screening in the first place. The culprit that makes the exam painful is the duck-billed speculum, which a provider inserts into the vagina and expands to view the cervix. Now, let me give you a brief history of the speculum. It was developed in the 1850s by the American father of gynecology, J. Marion Sims most notably without any input from its subjects, and reflecting the cultural norms of the time, 
which was to maintain a distance between a typically male provider and the female patient. Over the past 150 years, the speculum has not seen much change. Despite moving from an era of main, from mainframe computers to Apple Watches, and moving from an era where women were passive participants in their healthcare to an era where women actively demand control over their bodies. Ignoring this antiquated notion of women's health, our lab decided to pursue reimagining the gynecological exam and make it something that was more approachable to women. So, a typical gynecological exam involves insertion of the speculum. Then the provider uses an expensive microscope called a corposcope to create a magnified view of the cervix. What we wanted to do was decrease the cost of the corposcope, make it more portable, but also create a device that didn't have to use the speculum. We drew inspiration from a spy pen, which my professor came across while leafing through the pages of a duty-free magazine on an airplane. <laughs> and this led to the development of the pocket corposcope, a low-cost tool for cervical cancer screening. However, we realized that the pocket corposcope still required use of the speculum and still required insertion by a health provider. So it was my challenge to develop a tool that didn't require the speculum, didn't have the fear associated with it, and could potentially be inserted by the woman herself. This could move healthcare from the bricks and mortar of a hospital to the woman's home. Well, design, redesigning the pocket corposcope into a smaller tampon-sized form factor wasn't too difficult. However, it was a great challenge to redesign the speculum, given the biological factors of the woman's vagina, which has a lot of pressure on 22 that is expanded, that's inserted in it, and that needs to expand the vaginal walls to see the cervix. We went through several prototypes, trying to draw inspiration from familiar items around us. We initially went on the premise that we wanted to expand the area of the vagina closest to the cervix. So we stuck a, lit, a mini speculum on top of a slim rod, but that didn't work. We looked to menstrual cups, we looked to inflatable balloons, we looked to tampons, and we created a tampon device that could expand at the tip, but it didn't work. Eventually, after several iterations and through the human-centered design process, we came, across our, we came to our current design, which draws inspiration from the curved petals of a color lily, and we called it the color scope. The asymmetry of the color scope allows gentle manipulation of the cervix to bring it into view for optimal imaging. It allows for the tampon camera to be inserted for imaging, and the camera connects to a mobile phone that allows for real-time visualization. This here shows for the first time a woman using the colorscope to view her own cervix. What you see is it being inserted through the vaginal walls, the cervix coming into view, and being manipulated to get an optimal view. We've tested this device here at Duke, amongst patients and volunteers, and found that it enables both visualization of the cervix by providers and by women themselves, and that women completely prefer this over the dark-built speculum. Towards the end of my PhD, I received a grant from the Duke Global Health Institute that allowed me to come full circle and test the colorscope in my home country, Ghana where I conducted interviews and clinical studies. During one interview, one of the women I was talking to told me she had come into the hospital after bleeding for weeks. When she came, they sent her to the reproductive health unit to get screened for cervical cancer. She had never heard about cervical cancer, but she had heard of cancer, and she knew that it killed, and she was afraid. Unfortunately, during my interviews, stories like this were not uncommon. But I came across pacemakers in Ghana working hard to make sure that awareness and prevention of cervical cancer was being employed. NGOs, nurses, and doctors 
who had dedicated their lives to make sure no woman in Ghana died from cervical cancer. When I started the clinical studies in Ghana, initially I was worried that women would not take after the color scope, given the conservative culture we are raised in, but I was proven wrong. During one of the days, a group of women sponsored by their employer to get screened for cervical cancer came to the clinic where I was. I asked them if anyone would participate in our study. They were already kind of concerned and worried about this, what they were coming to do in the first place, and I only had two out of about 15 women sign up. When the first person came and was able to see her cervix, she went out excitedly and told everyone else about how comfortable it was and how she had been able to see it herself without the help of the provider on a screen. And, during, and I wasn't even in the room. I was preparing the second person when a nurse came in and told me, Mercy, everyone is so excited and wants to sign up. And that day, I reached full capacity and even had to turn some people away. But it really imprinted something in me, that women do want control over their health, and when given the opportunity to do so, respond in a powerful way. This is a quote from one of our nurses that says, people's spiritual and cultural beliefs sometimes put them off, especially when those who are providing the service are male. They don't want males to have a look at their private parts, so it makes it a bit difficult for them to come in willingly. The color scope has become more than a technology for cervical cancer screening. It has become a vehicle for, and a movement for women's empowerment and gives us women a new perspective on our own bodies. Perspectives of the color scope from its users inspired an art exhibit here at Duke, where artists from around the globe took perspectives of women who had used the color scope and produced artwork. Here, both participants and artists alike shared their personal stories about their invisible organ, the cervix. The success of this exhibit has led to the creation of a documentary called The Invisible Organ, which is going to be screened at the largest cervical cancer conference in Barcelona in March, and is led by my good friend Andrea Kim. At this point, I would like to invite each and every one of you to join our movement for reproductive health, to destigmatize the cervix and cervical cancer, talk to your friends and talk to your families, and together, let's make the invisible organ visible. Thank you.